Hey, how's it going? Welcome to episode 14 of Sound Editing and Design for Visual Media. Up to this point, we've done an overview of the film audio pipeline. I've shown you my Reaper editing templates and some tricks. And we've done a bit of sound design, field recording, and Foley as well. Now, we're by no means finished with the editing side of things, but moving forward as we get into topics like ambience design, layering, and movement in film, it's good for us as editors to have a basic understanding of what a 5-1 mix entails. Though we edit in stereo most of the time, it's it's really useful to think ahead. So this episode is an introduction into surround sound. So today we're actually not going to do a lot of in DAW work. This is more of a crash course in a bunch of theoretical concepts and hopefully this knowledge will help you be a better editor and mixer. We will build upon this knowledge in future episodes and I'll be referencing this episode a lot. So if you're revisiting, welcome back. 5.1 is an output channel configuration most commonly used in surround sound audio. Let's explain the number really quickly because the 0.1 is not exactly a decimal. This number tells us the count and configuration of our output channels. In 5.1, there are five boundary speakers plus an LFE or low frequency emitter. Using these numbers, we can codify different output channel configurations and distinguish between different multi-channel setups when they have the same number of channels. So for example, headphones or a regular stereo speaker setup is 2-0. If you have a subwoofer, you have a 2.1 system, which is a three speaker system. But there are other three speaker systems like LCR, what we call 3.0. Quadrophonic audio is 4.0 and so is LCRS. But the way those speakers are placed around the listener is slightly different as you can see on screen. After that comes 5.0, which is a slightly modified LCR configuration, plus a pair of surround speakers behind the listener. Add to that an LFE and you have 5.1, which is a six channel system. I use the term output channels instead of saying speakers, just because this is not always a one-to-one -one relationship. At a concert venue, for example, you may have tens of speakers in the venue, but if they are taking in one of two output channels, then it's essentially stereo. So the number of output channels is what ultimately dictates the sonic image. 5.1 consists of the usual left and right stereo speakers, plus a center speaker right between them, a pair of stereo speakers behind you, which we call the surrounds, and an LFE. LFE is the channel that takes care of outputting the front of low end energy in a 5-1 mix. We'll get to why this is in a second. The following chapter is an oversimplification of a number of complex topics summarized in the quickest way possible. So I don't want to hear a bunch of lip from you nitpicky Redditors. Kindly refer to the blog for more information on all these topics before bombarding me with hate mail. Thank you. So exactly why do we need this many speakers? To answer this, let's do a little crash course inside this crash course and talk a bit about the evolution of sound reproduction and a little bit on sound cognition and psychoacoustics as well. Each of these are huge topics, so I'll explain what I think is relevant as quickly as I can, but I will provide additional links if you want to study any of these further. So here we go. When sound reproduction was first invented, it was a one in one out relationship. In other words, you would use one device to capture changes in air pressure in an environment, AKA wiggly air, AKA sound. You will then transform that to an electric current and then you would use another device to transform that current back into kinetic energy, which would in turn cause changes in air pressure and you could hear back what was recorded. This was simple enough in theory, but of course the primitive versions of this technology were incredibly low fidelity until about the 1920s when RCA invented the first ribbon mic. But even as the fidelity improved, mono audio severely lacked width. You could basically reproduce sound in one axis. You had a point in space where all the sound came out of and you could create the illusion of depth by placing things closer or further away from the audio capturing device. But you couldn't convincingly create any sense of width, movement, or space. The advent of stereo audio made it possible for the first time for the number of output channels to be equal to the number of our ears. This was an important step forward as it allowed sound to be reproduced in a similar way to how our ears pick them up acoustically. Let's do a quick experiment. Take a look at this parking lot. Now close your eyes and imagine you're standing in it. You're about to hear a sound. Were you able to tell which direction that sound came from? If you thought it came from your left, you're right. But how do we do that? How can we tell the direction of a sound just by hearing it? Let's think of our ears as two microphones placed in this space, because in many ways they are. When a sound is produced in this space, the sound travels through the air in all directions towards our body. Coming from our left, the sound first hits our left ear directly, but some of it also wraps around our skull and arrives at our right ear slightly later. The distance between our ears are quite small compared to the speed of sound, so this delay is insanely short. 
but our brains are able to process the delay between the arrival of the sound to each ear and extrapolate that the sound must be closer to the ear that first picked it up. Furthermore, as the sound hits our skull, some of its higher frequency content decays and the sound changes, getting darker. The delay plus the amount of change in the intensity and frequency content of the sound tells us the angle of the sound, i.e. the difference between a sound on our 11 o'clock versus 9 o'clock. So by having two ears, not only can we hear things on our left and right, but our brain, through processing these minute differences between how the sound hits each ear, can also identify the placement of sounds all around us. We can also sense if the sound is moving and in which direction, and at what speed, because our brain is also keeping track of all this information and then comparing these minute differences at any given moment to the next. Taking this even further, the sound then bounces off our body, the ground, the ceiling, the walls, and any other surfaces and objects in the space, and gets reflected, decaying constantly. But some of those sounds eventually arrive back at our ears. So our brains are also analyzing what our ears pick up and compare that to what was heard moments earlier. And this helps them also get a sense of the size of the environment, as well as the hardness of surfaces. And even in an enclosed space, we can pinpoint where we and the source of sound fall in relation to the environment. All of this is insanely complex, yet the human brain can do this effortlessly and continuously throughout our lives, even if we're not aware of it. We can close our eyes, but we can never close our ears. The auditory cortex never sleeps. Stereo lets us output two channels of audio, which would then route to two speakers or one to each ear of your headphones. This allows us to manipulate the listener by outputting sounds that are slightly different in terms of frequency, timing, and loudness, which their brain will then analyze and extrapolate from that a direction and a sense of space either through recording the source using a stereo compatible mic arrangement, what's called true or natural stereo, or by using the pan pot in a multi-track mixer and some DSP trickery, we can also mimic the way a sound travels in space towards a listener and give them the illusion of space and width. Stereo speakers can also trick your brain into hearing sounds coming from directly between them. This is due to a psychoacoustic phenomenon known as phantom center. Our sound localization ability relies on processing two different streams of sound as they hit each of our ears. So if both channels in a stereo setup include the same sound, like a mono dialogue track, Assuming the listener is wearing headphones or is perfectly aligned with the speakers in an equilateral triangle, then theoretically the same sound would hit both ears at the same time. Since it's impossible for the exact same sound to occur in nature from two different sources at the same time, our brain is tricked into thinking that the sound is coming from directly in front of it. From there, adjusting the pan knob creates a change in the amplitude of the sound going to each output channel, thereby creating the illusion that the sound is moving in a panoramic field. Stereo images still have limitations though. For example, they can't really trick our brain into hearing sounds coming from behind us or above us because any sound they produce will be loudest at the source before decaying in the environment and our brains will always be able to tell. This is especially true with speakers that are some distance away from our ears and go through an environment before reaching them. Due to the way the exterior of our ears are shaped, our brains can also analyze the placement of sounds on a vertical axis, though we are less accurate on this axis. Doing this gets much easier in enclosed spaces as our brain can get further information from the reflective surfaces in the environment. So since stereo speakers are always in front of us, it's not really possible to put a sound above or below another sound, nor to make it come from behind us. We can achieve a semi-convincing illusion of this by changing the frequency content of the two output channels to mimic the way sounds decay as they hit our earlobes at different angles. HTRF is in itself a very, very complex topic, but suffice it to say, it doesn't work as well in speakers and therefore is not much use to us in a theater where speakers are tied to a point in space. So this is where surround sound comes in. Stereo, in a sense, provides the listener with a window into a space. We can hear things on our left and right, and we can even perceive them to be further away or closer to us based on their frequency content, reverb profile, and more. 5.1, on the other hand, adds to the immersive experience by placing you in the center of the space. Utilizing a pair of stereo speakers that we put behind the listener, surround sound creates a 360 degree field of audio and places us in the middle of the action. It also adds a center speaker up front. This provides additional power to the front of the audio field, but more importantly, it gives us a more accurate center. Like we said earlier, the creation of a phantom center relies heavily on the listener being perfectly aligned to the stereo speaker pair. In a movie theater, 
theater, the majority of the audience is actually not perfectly aligned to the front two speakers. Without a center speaker, audience members sat in the outer seats of a theater will not hear the sound the way it was mixed. So having a dedicated center speaker is very important. It also creates separation and houses some of our most important sounds. The LFE adds a somatic layer to the experience. We feel even more affected by the sounds in the environment as the ground shakes beneath us and low end hits our chests. It's the cherry on top of an already immersive experience to have ground shaking low end. Something to note is that 5.1 doesn't give us free reign to send whatever sounds we want wherever and whenever. In fact, there are certain conventions that inform the majority of the decisions 5.1 mixers and editors have to make. The goal of audio and films after all is to immerse the audience into the film world. We want the audience to be captivated and their eyes to be glued to the screen. Having more speakers can help with this, but it can just as easily hurt if we're not careful to adhere to certain principles. Now these principles aren't always hard rules, but they're still very important to be aware of. You want to stick to them most of the time and break these rules with care and purpose. They say the best way to sound design for movies is in a way that doesn't make itself noticed, but one that simply adds to the experience without getting in the way of of the story. So hopefully you're beginning to understand why it's really important to know this stuff. Movies, and by extension their sound, are like a magic trick. You are creating an illusion, and if it's engaging enough to the senses, it'll transport the mind of our listeners into another world. And to make any illusion work well, it's really important to get into the mind of the person you're trying to make it work on. So once again, let's get into the head of our listeners. Humans are very instinctively reactive to sound. It's a primal defense mechanism because as humans, we have a limited field of vision, but we have a completely spherical field of hearing. It's coded into our DNA to get clues about our surroundings through hearing, and we react to them instinctively. When you hear a loud bang out of nowhere behind you, you're going to look back and see what's up. This is important to know as we mix in 5.1 because we don't want to send too many sudden sounds to the surrounds. The main function of surround speakers is to put us in the center of the action and immerse us. But we still want most of the action to happen in front of us, where the screen is. For the most part, surround sounds are tasked with playing stereo or quadraphonic ambience, audio, and big reverbs. Everything needed to expand the space that we are putting the listener in. They may also occasionally help create additional movement, like when a spaceship darts into view from off screen. <laughs> But again, we don't want to overdo this. On the other hand, you definitely want to refrain from putting too much dialogue or a sudden gunshot sound in the surrounds. Because in those cases, the audience is very likely to instinctively turn around and look behind them and away from the screen. Of course, horror movies can sometimes turn this very principle on its head because they do want to startle you. But overall, this is something to use very sparingly as it will also reduce from its effect if we overdo it. To cut a long story short, too much activity in the surrounds will lead to a very annoying viewing experience. The center speaker plays the most important stuff, which, you guessed it, is dialogue, very, very important sound effects and foley elements that pertain to the story, and very occasionally it may also include elements from the music. Especially when it comes to dialogue, we want to stick to the center speaker for most of the film. Even if we are watching two people converse in a wide shot like this, we don't necessarily want to pan our dialogue accordingly, because maybe the next shot cuts to a different angle of these two people, and now we have to completely flip the pan. This again takes away from the immersion. Our brains are not super accustomed to sudden changes in the sonic image because they basically never happen in real life if you don't know how to teleport. Now we seem to have suspended this disbelief when it comes to sudden changes of camera angle and that's because shots like this are part of the film grammar that all of us are so used to. Finally, the LFE is a funnel for most of the low end energy in the project. For the same reason we don't put a lot of sudden sounds in the surrounds, it's also important to remain cognizant of how much low end we send there. Rumble and low end in the surrounds are also a no-no, as those can also make the audience turn around. Low end sounds also have relatively little trouble filling the room, so we output them all from one place. Placing the LFE speaker closer to the ground also helps add to its somatic impact. We feel really low end frequencies as much through our bodies as we do through our ears. High passing our boundary speakers also help keep them balanced. So we can see that these speakers often serve very specific purposes, which may seem to limit our choices most of the time. But these conventions are also established in the film grammar, as Dolby technology is almost 40 years old now. From a psychoacoustic standpoint, these conventions make a lot of sense. From the editor or the mixer's point of view, it's also very useful to group these speakers in subgroups. We have a stereo pair up front and a stereo pair in the back and they can also work as a quad array. Then we have a mono center, but it can also play well with the front left and front right speakers for an LCR. And finally, we have the mono LFE. 
In other words, we have two stereo mixes and two mono mixes, and we can also mix and match them with care into LCR, quad, or 5.0 arrangements. So as editors, we also need to know all of this because we want to provide our mixers with appropriate sounds, sometimes tailor designing them for a specific speaker, both in terms of channel count and frequency content. Keep in mind that 5.1 by no means eliminated all the limitations of stereo. 5.1 expands the field of audio on a 2D plane, which finally allows us to place sounds behind the listener. But it doesn't exactly expand the Z axis. With 5.1, we're still limited when it comes to tricking the audience into hearing sounds coming from above them. This is probably part of why audio professionals find ways every year to add to the 5.1 speaker count with 7.1, 9.1, 11.1, and Atmos, all of which build on top of 5.1. And while modern movies are slowly leaning towards Atmos setups, it's still a logical next step from stereo to start editing and mixing in 5.1. And once you get used to 5.1, it's a really easy upgrade to any number of speakers above that. Getting into the technical, a 5.1 mix is rendered as six channels in a multi-channel wave file. Now, when we print a stereo file, we all know that channel one goes to the left speaker and channel two goes to the right speaker. So when 5.1 came around, audio professionals had to agree on a certain order for the channels to be printed. Somehow, someway, we globally came up with two very common orders instead of one. We have the film order and the SIMTI order. The film order starts from left to right and front to back with the LFE coming in last. L-C-R, L-S-R-S, LFE. The SIMTI order instead groups the channels into the subgroups that we previously mentioned. So channels one and two sent to the front left and right pair, channel three is the center, channel four is the LFE, and channels five and six sent to the surround stereo pair. This order seems slightly more logical to me personally, and I have a little jingle to remember this order. It goes like this, L-R-C, L-F-E, L-S-R-S. So which order to print your mix in relies heavily on the spec requirements from whoever you're printing the mix for. So make sure to double check with your production company. But really from the listener's perspective, this order doesn't change what's eventually heard. And there's no difference in how we treat our six different channels. It's simply a matter of routing and the deliverable. Of course, it's also very, very easy to take a six channel array from one order and simply rearrange the channels to get to the other one. Commonly, you deliver film audio in an eight channel polywave file. The first six channels being the 5-1 mix, printed in the specified channel order, and channel seven and eight contain the stereo mix. Unless your movie or TV show is extremely high budget, we usually don't do two separate mixes for this. What usually happens is that you do your mix in 5.1 and to get the stereo mix, you do what's called a fold down or a mix down, making minor adjustments, if any, to the overall mix. We will cover the specifics of fold downs and how they're done in the next episode when I show you my template. Other than the full mix, you're also required to deliver three additional stems. So the full mix is the DME mix, including the dialogue, music, and effect. And you additionally deliver the DX stem, which contains all the dialogue, narration, and walla, the M stem, which includes all the music, and the E stem, which includes all the sound effects. Basically, everything that isn't in the DX or the MX stem goes to the E stem or the SFX stem. The stems are required for a few reasons beyond archival purposes. For international releases, for example, the production company will usually have the film mixed in one language, say English, and once they receive the mix, they will simply strip the DX stem and replace it with dubs in a foreign language. Stems are also used when creating trailers, episode recaps in TV shows, or other promotional material for the company. When you're editing a trailer, you are making a very, very quick and short cut of the film. If you do this with all the audio intact, there will be a lot of incoherent skips in the music and dialogue. Instead, you want to provide the trailer editors with stems so that once they're finished with the edit, they can take one of the music cues, for example, and overlay it on top of the entire trailer. Or as is more common these days, add their own hyped up music to the trailer that may not appear anywhere in the film. Or in episode recaps, for example, you may want narration to be overlaid on top of a quick montage of a bunch of key shots from the previous episode. Finally, DVD and Blu-ray releases that come with commentary will usually turn down these stems in varying amounts or strip them entirely and mix the commentary on top of that. In the next episode, we're gonna set up a template in Reaper for mixing in 5.1 with all the stem print tracks, the full mix and the fold down tracks ready to go. We will also set up a bunch of monitoring tracks. These are useful because you can move your project seamlessly between your stereo system and a 5.1 compatible space. 
So even if you don't have a 5.1 system at home, you'll be able to monitor your entire 5.1 mix using stereo speakers. But that's enough yapping for today. Make sure to check the blog post because there's a lot that I have cut out of this video. And if there's one thing to take away from this entire episode is to learn what you can about cycloacoustics and sound cognition. And I will guarantee you that it helps you in any field of audio. Subscribe to stay tuned for the next episode. And if you like the work I do, please consider donating to me through buymeacoffee.com. The link for that will be in the description. Thanks to all our previous donors. Take care of yourself and I'll see you soon. Bye.